a Labour MP who said, oh, I don't really like people saying that. You know, we're not we haven't got people wearing uniforms and stuff. And I said, but look at what's going through. Look at the legislation. That is what fascism is. But I worry that we've got a we've got a problem with getting over to people the risks because they just immediately write that off as you're talking about Nazis. And and it's a kind of block. Does, does anybody recognize that as, a, as an issue? Molly. That's what I was trying to say um, about the very British coup point, because like everything in this country, the worst shittiest things are so polite, aren't they? Like the empire, you know, it's all dressed up in nonsense. And I mean, I'm so much in track with Peter over all this stuff, but you know, so it's hard to identify it, but that's why we went through that systematically. You can send people to my website. It was like a piece of academic work that we did. It's not, um, rhetorical at all it's just it's not hyperbolic it's just factual and we are seeing uniforms we now routinely see generals with all their gold stuff on mm. news programs that's new i can remember when that first happened it was since brexit i always complain about it and you know so this is another thing that i think is really important use that page remember the things you're looking for and then identify them so i have democracy alerts on my twitter feed and quite often people argue with me oh it's absolutely harmless having a general there and then i argue back at them so i think i think that's that's the job to be done you know be aware of what you're looking for and then constantly identify those examples so i don't go around you know calling people fascist like some kind of wolfie smith character but I am very clear about what I'm looking for now. And that's why it was good that we did that piece of work because it was a bit amorphous for us as well and hidden behind all those, you know, lace curtain doily type things that we use in British culture to allow the really awful bastardy stuff to happen without anybody noticing. Um, so you need to know what you're looking for and then you need to constantly identify it in specific ways, not, um, not with general labels. Yeah. Thank you. That's for brilliant advice. Um, I'm going to turn to questions now. The first one we um, got right at the beginning of proceedings from Dennis Buckley, who asks, should people be prevented from having careers in politics, i.e. doing nothing else, I assume? And would citizens' assemblies work with drafted participants rather than volunteers? Who would like to have first crack at that? So should we have career politicians? Would citizens assemb citizen assemblies be better with drafted participants rather than volunteers? Richard. Unmute. Need you to unmute, Richard. Sorry, I thought I was. Um, I got the um, cover of the chat over my um, label. Um, I have a problem with citizens assemblies because I believe in representative democracy and are citizens assemblies really representative democracy? Um, I think they have a very powerful role in providing opinion. I don't think they can eventually make decisions. Should we have career politicians? I think we have to understand that actually being a politician is a career, that we do want some people to become career politicians. We want them to be good at their jobs. And you can't just arrive in Westminster and be great at your job. We've seen a lousy prime minister. We saw a pretty bad one before that. We saw a pretty poor one before that. Um, and these people are not good at their jobs. They didn't go in with career politicians in mind. Well, Theresa May probably did, but the others have always been convicted of something else. And I think we do need to do that, but we want to expect that there will be some other skill for First of all, now the problem with that, of course, is does that exclude young people from Parliament? And is there a reason why we should exclude young people from Parliament? Perhaps what we do need is a lifespan of a politician. Nobody can be a politician for more than 20, 25 years at most, that there is going to be some finite limit. Um, and that would encourage people to go in at you know 50, knowing that they've got the rest of their life. It would encourage people to go in young, knowing they can work till 50, but there's going to be something else. And I think that that idea that you're not going to be here forever might be more important than saying we can't have. Because saying somebody can only do two terms, you know, a US president style thing, but they've spent years in the Senate beforehand. They need to build up the experience to be able to do that job. It is a real job to do. So let's not kick people out because they've been there for a while. Yeah. 
I think I saw you saying Molly, but you were on mute, but I'm going to hop in anyway. Uh, I, I slightly want to extend on what Richard said, but actually I agree with him. Um, so, I mean, being a Green, you're never going to be a career politician, right? That's obvious. And I actually got elected when I was 50, when my third child left home, and that worked perfectly for me. And I would have done two terms and left happy had it not been for Brexit, because I, I think you get... Uh, there's two sides to it. One side is if you're an MEP anyway and you actually do the legislative work yourself, it's really hard involved work and you do need quite a lot of knowledge and experience to do it well. But as time goes on, you get kind of jaded, you get pushed away from where you were originally and you become sort of institutionalized. So I think you, I mean, I was, to be honest with you, just at my peak when I got kicked out, which was infuriating because I just worked out how everything worked but I hadn't got to the point of like seeing it as a job and becoming complacent about it. Um, but yeah, it's a difficult job and you can see a, lo a lot of people doing it really badly and we don't want people doing it badly. Now on the citizens assemblies, there's a really important role for deliberative democracy, which we don't have in our system. Uh, this is partly why we're really struggling with public debate because we're moving into a system where, and this is partly because of social media discussion, you're, you're right and you're, or you're wrong and everything's black and white and you decide what the right position is and then you signal that to everybody else and you tell everybody else they're bad and wrong. But obviously the point about politics is all the messy grey bit in the middle, isn't it? And that's why it's a difficult job. Um, and so that ability to deliberate with people you disagree with is crucial to a successful democracy. And that's why the deliberative bit of politics, whether that's school debates or, um, you know, or citizens assemblies is really important. So um, I think the problem with citizens assembly is who's going to pull the lever at the end of the day. And that person has to be a representative politician. But citizens assemblies are a brilliant addition to our representative democracy, I think. I was just going to comment that if the question was about whether or not MPs should have second jobs, um, which it may have been, I think you could read the question both ways. Um, I work with a, very, very closely with a lot of MPs and a lot of different parties. And most of them, I have to say, are working so hard and so brilliantly on behalf of their constituents, but on behalf of uh, the British public as a whole, because they are doing great work on chairing all party groups that are very powerful at, at scrutinising the government on coronavirus or, or Brexit or whatever, that they just simply wouldn't have time to do another job. However, there are honourable exceptions to that. Um, there are those that are still serving as medics. Um, uh, there is a Conservative MP called Dan Poulter, who has been uh, working throughout the pandemic as a doctor. Um, as well as juggling all of his constituency responsibilities and, and parliamentary duties. So I think there is just a huge difference between those that are on the make and are lobbying on behalf of their other employer and those who are maintaining their continuous professional development uh, so that if they lose their jobs, they, they are still qualified to practice doing the jobs that they were doing before they entered Parliament, and because it is a great insight uh, that, that Parliament needs to understand the pressures uh, of those people doing public service roles or, or volunteering roles or whatever it is. So um, I think we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater on, on ruling on whether or not MPs should have second jobs. Okay. There's a huge difference between lobbying jobs and, and proper jobs. Yeah, absolutely. Can I just support that view? For example, although I've really not been much of a practicing chartered accountant for the last 20 years, I still have a practicing certificate because it is my backstop. If everything else won, Same. Day, <laughs> Same. I am a chartered accountant for that reason. So I keep my practicing certificate and I keep my training up to date. So it is sometimes important to have, and I have a little bit of accountancy income for that reason, even though I actually make most of my work as campaigning as a professor. But actually that's value. So we should have... You know, what we have to be broad minded. Having a hinterland is, is important. Yeah, I think that this is the really critical thing. There aren't black and whites. The world is actually grey. We and a lot of what we probably all want is a little bit grey. 
we actually have to find those compromises in the grayness. I'm frightened by blacks and whites because blacks and whites are the extremities and they appear from both sides. And boy, I run a blog, do I get the rubbish? I see on it and others who are used to that will see it as well. You know, we need to be worried about and find the ability to compromise with each other still around sensible solutions. Right, now we need to crack on because we've got quite a lot of questions here, right. Um, from Patricia R. She's very concerned about the unwillingness of the Metropolitan Police to investigate um, and uh, their willingness to shield people who should not be shielded. Um, we'll take that bit first. Um, what, do, what do we feel about the relationship between the Met and the current government? Go on, Peter. Go on, Peter. Go for it. Yeah, obviously, anybody who's followed the Daniel Morgan murder, and I did the podcast and the book with... Um, so good. Alex um, with uh, Alistair Morgan, come a close friend of his murder, his brother Daniel, uh, in 1987 in a car park with an axe and in the cover-up collusion of the Met and the Murdoch press because the suspect's private detective agency it to be owned was, and was taken over by one of the police investigating his murder, was suspected, arrested on suspicion of it, became the one-stop shop for phone hacking, computer hacking, uh, personal intrusion and all kinds of nefarious stuff, including the Paddy Pants Down story, including the buggy of David Meller and the toe job and all that stuff was that, you know, that was that company and that was Daniel Morgan's company. And that was what Gordon Brown called the criminal media nexus, i.e. And it emerged in phone hacking. There was a deal that's allegedly, according to Ed Miliband, security services also involved because they'd launched a material to news of the world but a deal, a deal of kind of compromise, a, um, a, a form of extrajudicial punishment of Mazuma Mood would tip off the police. They'd fake up stories about Red Mercury, somebody trying to ki kidnap Beckham. And in return, because the Met could see that Rebecca Brooks was whining and dining Tony Blair or whining and dining murder was whining, whining and dining Margaret Thatcher, the Met would not investigate news of the world or the Murdoch Empire. And basically, you still, the problem is here, the Met. The Met is, is when they have the MPA, you know, the Metropolitan Police Authority, it only controls some of the powers. Uh, ultimately, the person who controls Pesodic is Priti Patel. So it's a political appointment. That's a very, very odd, and it goes back to Molly's thing, you know, with the greatest democracy the p there's a metropolitan police what a great institution the first great police force in the world but especially um things like special but it's special operations are national and they answer the home office so there's no the constabulary system is great my first ever job i did was the chief tim pickett smith inspired by this great uh, chief constable devon uh devon and cornwell john alderson community policing but the Met is more like the Prussian system of secret police. And it is emerging again. These structures, in a way, what is so interest, is interesting about, you know, um, the allegations of blackmail involving journalists and the ask of, of MPs by whips saying they will not fund their constituencies if they don't vote for They write to the 22 committee against Johnson. And the Met should be investigating. The Sun is involved, apparently, in some way. What you have then is two arm of the state, kind of quite the arm of the media working together to control the politicians. That that's happened again after Daniel Morgan in 1987, after phone hacking in 2011. Here we are back again. The Met not investigating these parties. The Met not investigating blackmail. That shows me is exactly what Molly is saying. There is a structural problem. The only way to sort this is institutional constitutional reform of the Met. Um, to continue on that, and then we'll take the second part of the question, which I'll read out. Can I say something very briefly and specifically about more about the parties? Because I've been drafting letters for our various politicians to write and nag, and Jenny Jones, our peer, was very active because she sat on the oversight board for the Met for a long time and was highly critical. And so she tried to get the um, independent office for complete police complaints to investigate the Met. But, the, you know, the path to achieving that was so narrow. And so, as Peter says, there's no real way of getting them to do anything. Even, even if you are part of a political body, 
because we have also the Caroline Russell on the GLA who also tried to get them to investigate. But effectively, you have no control over what they were doing at all. And their excuses were pitiful. You know, they had guys outside, so they know, know who was there. Um, and so they actually had evidence and their excuse that, you know, when we have evidence, you know, the whole purpose of the police is to investigate and find the evidence. That's what we pay them for. So their excuses were pathetic. Um, and now I've spent a long time involved with a lot of people in the radical end of politics defending the police because, you know, we've got all this stuff about defund the police, which I'm always strenuously resisting. And I do believe in the concept of, of policing by consent. But we can only have that if everybody is treated the same by the police. And I'm sure that's never been the case. I've defended that as a principle that's never been held, but I've nonetheless defended it because I think it's an important principle. But it's just obvious that it's, it's not a principle you can argue and defend any longer. And I find that really upsetting because, you know, I've been in countries, as I'm sure we all have, where the police are not people that help you at all. Like I remember when my daughter was living in Russia for a year, you know, we went there and something happened. I can't remember somebody broke in or something. And I said, well, you know, obviously you're going to go to the police. And she just laughed, you know. And so so we don't live in that situation, but we don't want to live in that situation. And that's why we need the police to act as if nobody is above the law. And it's very clear at the moment that the Met Police is making decisions as a result of political pressure and not treating everybody the same. And that's kind of the end of I'm not going to say I'm abandoning confidence in the police entirely, but, you know, it's really shaky. And that is another one of those institutions that keeps our democracy working, that you allow people to use violence in a society and you allow them to do that because they, they treat everybody fairly. And we can't accept we can't allow them to use violence if they're going to use it on behalf of some people in society against other people. And I'm afraid that's what we're seeing them doing now. Um, just to remind people, if they could please put some um, questions in the chat, um, that would be really helpful. Um, Patricia had a, had a follow up question concerned about her ability to do anything remotely as she lives in France. But I think also it's one of the issues um, that a number of people have that they feel will their citizenship be threatened by them getting actively involved in in protest or in um, resisting what the government's doing or being part of dissent. So um, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that, on how can you participate while living abroad? You can still sign the same petitions, and but I suppose you've got no recourse to an MP. Difficult. We'll come back to, we'll come back to that. Right, let's take another question. By the way, my answer to that is always phone into um, a phone-in programme. Mm -hmm. um, if you... Get yourself geared up on a particular issue, learn it, practice it. I've done quite a lot of work on the Jeremy Vine show on Radio 2 over the years um, and have enjoyed winding Jeremy up on occasions over the years, so I know quite well. Um, and, you know, I've sat in their offices whilst people have been, you know, putting together previous slots and they frequently don't have enough callers. They're actually calling people, the regulars, almost all of whom are right wing callers and saying, will you call in? We haven't got anyone to comment on this issue. So actually, there is an opportunity to learn your particular bugbear well and to present it on the radio. And if it isn't on BBC Radio 2, well, it is on a local radio station or, you know, LBC or somewhere else. There is a need for sane voices on these programmes and a lot of insane people phone them. Um, well, I use the word insane a little unfairly, but, you know, those who are from the lunatic fringe of politics do. So get in there, say something, please. Right. Counteract the swivel eyed. That's what mm. you clearly need to do. Right. Um, just to say... Uh, that Paul Brown has posted that um, if you could remind everybody that on Saturday the 5th of February there'll be a rally for democracy and against the elections bill and parliament um, and we'll put a link up make votes matter have got the information so if we want to get involved on the February the 5th right questions um Right. Uh, I think a lot of people are concerned about the po prospects for a progressive alliance and the barriers to that. Naomi, what, what are you picking up on from government, on from politicians on the prospect of, a, of well, an overt or tacit <laughs> progressive alliance? 
uh, what I'm picking up from government is everything that's in the elections bill and there are bits of it that are designed specifically because they don't want a progressive alliance and uh, if the elections bill goes through unamended it will make any kind of alliance working much more difficult it will make it much more difficult for the unions to fund the Labour Party uh, etc etc but that's not the question the question is about um, a progressive alliance Um, I think we are in a situation at the moment where Broadly, the two knights have decided a bit of a non-aggression pact. Um, uh, we saw that play out to greater or lesser extent in um, three by-elections last year um, in Bexley, uh, Batley and Spen, Cheshire and North Shropshire, actually, sorry, four. Um, and some mixed messaging around some of those that, that, that meant that you know, there was probably slightly more um, activity from the the party that wasn't meant to be doing as much um, as as uh, the other party would have hoped. Um, so I think come the next election, largely I think driven by party finances being very very tight at the moment, uh, they just simply won't have the capacity to fight all six hundred odd constituencies that they fight. Um, uh, as much as as they'd like to so sort of by definition these non-aggression packs will happen as they tend to do anyway targeting targeted campaigning target seat campaigns are are what they've always done Um, in terms of a sort of formalized progressive alliance um, Best of Britain does lots and lots of constituency level data Uh, we do it as regularly as we can afford to do it is incredibly expensive so we, we can't do it as often as we'd like but our most recent one we did was not just looking at how people intend to vote at the next election, but ask them, and if that party doesn't stand, where does your vote go? To really try to get to the nuts and bolts of, well, are Lib Dems as likely to vote Conservative as they are Labour if the Lib Dem isn't standing? I.e., does a Lib Dem standing actually help Labour by taking votes off the Conservatives? No. <laughs> that, that's not what the data says. Um, when, a, when a Lib Dem candidate doesn't stand, in the average English constituency, it's breaking less than 20% to the Conservatives, 40% plus to Labour, um, 20% to or even nearly 30% to the Greens, and, and sort of similar ratios uh, between them all. The vast majority of votes between Lib Dems, Greens and Labour go to one another than they do to the Conservatives. About 25% of the Labour vote goes to the Conservatives, so a bit more than the Lib Dem vote when when Labour don't stand. Now, of course, there are different situations and different seats across the country. So at Best of Britain, we've been making sure that the the party um, leaderships and campaigns directors have seen that data, have access to it, um, and, uh, and, and we will continue to do that. Um, but it is incredibly difficult. Um, and... There is a real sense within, you know, both of the two main opposition parties that that they don't want election pacts and they certainly want to be don't want to be overt about them, even if they do secretly want them. So whether or not we we get there or not remains to be seen. But I I think well I know that at the moment the arithmetic is very very clear. It's the only way uh, to to get the current government out of number ten is for those parties to work together more than just non-aggression packs it will require some stand asides there was an mrp poll out on boxing day that showed that that starmer could have a majority government and was set to take back most of the red wall but when i got hold of the data behind that poll and analyzed it if just 50 percent of the reform uk vote went to the conservatives it wiped it would wipe out that labor majority And remember in 2017 and in 2019, UKIP and the Brexit party did stand down for the Conservatives en masse to try and stop uh, a Conservative loss or or any other party uh, or coalition uh, group getting the keys to number 10. So I think we have to assume that the Reform UK party Party would do that again. So one swallow doesn't make a summer. and, And as much as I know that a progressive alliance at the moment is the only chance uh, for, for unseating the Conservatives from number 10. I don't put the odds of it succeeding very high at the moment, but the more they hear from people like you, the more they might be persuadable to change their mind on that. I've got a question um, 
from Rachel Marshall. Would a move to a PR electoral system in Parliament help free us from the worst of the whip culture of party discipline, as seen in today's news? How does discipline work in other parliaments which are not first past the post? Anybody want to have a get, crack at that one? Will I launch into that and say a bit about <clears throat> progressive alliance as well? Um, every legislature needs discipline because it needs a majority to get the legislation through. So um, when I was in the European Parliament, there was a lot of whipping. We, we've never, we don't use a whip as Greens, but you know, there's always a certain amount of moral pressure, all the same, even though you can ultimately vote with your conscience. Obviously, if there are more parties, then what you're trying to do is get a majority across parties rather than within party. And I think that changes the culture in lots of ways that are generally positive because you don't get this um, us and them. Um, there's lots of us's and lots of them's, as it were. So I think in that sense, the sort of tribal politics will be undermined. But I think you'd still get, you know, you'd still get people appointed to try and get you voting the right way. And to some extent, the organisation of parties is necessary to make the, the legislative process work. If you've got hundreds of people, they have to be managed to some extent. Uh, obviously, what we're hearing about today has gone on for a long time in both the main parties. And it's, well, it's an utter disgrace. And I'm sure this party's worse and the pork barreling and the use of our money to bribe people to vote in a certain way is disgraceful. And I hope, and, and possibly also needs to be investigated by the Met, but I do hope um, evidence is forthcoming about that. Wanted to say quickly on the Progressive Alliance, I totally agree with Naomi. It's just, it's essential. And I've argued, maybe people here have heard me argue before that we should have, we should have the, the three parties that are standing up for democracy working in, on a sort of popular front basis. Because it's, it's gone beyond party loyalty now. It's about, are you for democracy or are you not? Um, but as Naomi says, the Liberal Democrats and Labour have sort of worked out that, that this nod, nod, wink, wink thing will work for them, they think. I don't think it will because general elections are very different from by-elections. Everybody will come out to vote. A lot of people will only have seen this white guy or that white guy on the telly. And that's the basis on which they'll make their decision. And they won't be wised up about what's happening in their constituency at all. So um yeah so we need we need something a lot better than that but but basically my view of a progressive alliance is it needs to be based around an agenda of constitutional reform not a policy agenda but an agenda that says we believe in certain basic things about democracy like people have a right to be represented by the people they vote for seems pretty fundamental to me never been real in my life because i've never elected a green so yeah but anyway a whole raft of other things written constitution democratic house of lords you know take the monarchy out of government and so on i mean we we could sit here between those three parties and write that constitution tonight we agree about all that stuff and if we had a progressive alliance we could transform our democracy and that's that's the prize much more than just who wins the next election and i really strongly agree with that because i think that's so fundamentally important and let's be honest there are people in other part, you know, parties who agree with that I mean I work very closely with um, Caroline I admit or I'm a member of the Green New Deal group Clive Lewis is and he's from Labour and they cooperate and you know, come the election uh, Clive will be opposed by a Green does that totally makes sense at the moment well Norwich has a strong green representation on its council but the point is that we actually do need what Molly's just said this agreement to actually transform politics so we can then properly disagree with each other over policy but until we get the foundations right I don't think we can actually have the proper policy debates we need and so so many people are actually not represented by anybody at the moment including vast numbers of people who support Labour because they don't like what Labour's talking about I mean if anybody heard Rachel Reeves talking about the economy today frankly I don't recognise that as a policy I support at all. Um, I think one of uh, some of our um our audience are sort of are wondering what the hell are we going to do I think I think we need to have some we've had some action points we've got to wise up on what constitutes fascism go and have a look at um, Molly's 14 points we've got to um, go on demonstrations go on sign petitions but but what are, what are we going to do? and what appetite do you feel there is for the for the the progressive parties to make fundamental change to make these things happen 
anybody? Well, I'm I'm going to go back to Timothy Snyder because his book on tyranny is a short book. I think it's got 20 very short chapters. And at the end of every chapter, he gives you advice about what to do. So I took a lot of his advice. I found it really helpful. I think the most useful thing is defend institutions because it's our institutions that are really under attack. And he doesn't really care which institutions you defend. You know, trade unions, obviously very important. You know, the most important thing you can do is become active in a political organization. The European movement, I'm obviously active there or political party or a trade union, whatever, get active in one of those institutions if you're concerned about democracy. But even if it's just the parent teacher association or a local dance club, those things that bind society together are disappearing. And that's partly why people are left alone sitting in their bedrooms, swallowing lies that are being pumped out to them by people funded by the oligarchs. So, you know, I think there's 20 good ideas in that book. So please, I'm sure it's available online and you can find them. But the top of my list is always about defending institutions. Join an institution and make sure by the end of the year it's stronger than it was when you joined it. I think it's, it's the most important thing you can do. But informing yourself is important as well, knowing your enemy. Um, and yeah, I mean, one of the things I keep meaning to do, I'm halfway through writing a book called Democracy, a User's Guide, and it kind of explains stuff that I think is obvious maybe to some of us, but other people really don't understand at all. And we're not told in school how our democracy works. So, you know, people are, I mean, if you go campaigning in a general election, I mean, obviously I stand as a candidate, you just want to weep when you get to the doorstep and you know the lies people have been told, the way they're being manipulated because they don't understand what their vote can do and how, or even what election they're voting in, even they think they're voting for Jeremy Corbyn, you know, I mean, it's a tragedy. So I think informing yourself and then informing other people um, about the power that we do have and then the power that we need and campaigning for that. And yeah, and, and also rip down all those lace curtains and all that guff around the empire and this being the mother of all parliaments and the greatest democracy. It's, I mean, I, I studied PP at Oxford. I believed so much of that nonsense for so long. Even the fact that an unwritten constitution was a good thing. So, you know, I mean, challenge all those things that, you know, you imbibed with your mother's milk about the constitution and our democracy, because they're all nonsense. We, we, we don't live in a democracy and we never have and we really deserve to. Peter, obviously, just... by the independent, independent media is absolutely vital, Peter. So please. Yeah, I think interesting thing, uh, you know, West Country Voices, Bylines Networks, my own trajectory as a dramatist getting involved uh, in journalism 10 years ago, young journalists coming to us. I think, just as I said, you know, everything was always wrong with the British state, its post-imperial guys uh, was already wrong before Brexit's now revealed it. I'm optimistic on the activism like you show. I'm optimistic of the younger generation and generally much more optimistic about civil society. So I am on the left, but I'm not a statist on the left. I do believe the power resides with people. I'm not a narco-syndicalist, don't get me wrong. I believe in police and government and things like that. But I'm amazed during lockdown just how much, with this absent, catastrophically incoherent government, that people internalise their own rules. And they looked after their neighbours. They masked themselves. I know we hear about the scandemic crowd and the anti-vaxxers and all these people breaking the rules, including our own prime minister. But don't forget the software of democracy doesn't exist, as Caroline Lucas described it, in that fake Gothic building, rat infested and falling into the Thames, i.e. Parliament. It exists inside us, in our heads, and our collective heads in civil society, when you join a choir, doing all the things that, you know, Mod is talking about, and Tim Snyder work on a blog, you know, start a, a news site. I, I, I do think I look back, I gave up, I didn't give up, but I had a young family, I kind of retreated from politics in 97 and been quite active, because um, I kind of thought, oh, well, Blair and Brown in charge, you'll be okay. And that's when things really start to go wrong. And, um, in, I have now a kind of, especially seeing what's happened to Johnson now and the Northern Wall and the way people have turned against him, I think irrevocably, radically. I'll just read an essay why I appealed to them because he seemed authentic compared to sort of robots like Theresa May and other sort of you know, crafted and careful politicians. Um, and now they hate him. And 
in a way, and I said the British peoples, all the four nations and regions, it's not the, you know, all of us. I think there is still that radical edge there. I think there is an element of self-sufficiency, which has its bad sides. But it did have a revolutionary side, you know, <laughs> with the decapitation of a king and the glorious revolution and the reform act. And I, all those things you're doing and NEM is doing, all these organizations are, are, are the future. And, but it may be as simple as you know, talking to the people on your allotment, joining a choir, getting out there, and, and, and thinking for yourself. News, of course, I will say, accurate information. Don't get the, a blog on Facebook somebody sent you about Wuhan and 5G. Uh, but this is all growing up. This is, I always say, social media is like the city. The first big industrial city in London was the largest. A million people can see the end of it. And it was bloody awful. There was crime, there was murder, there was pollution, there were chimneys of child labour. It was just terrible. And that's partly because strangers, they did in small towns before, or villages, the sunny strangers were thrown together. They didn't know how to cope with each other. And I would say I live in the centre of London, you know, especially since the, the violence of the 80s and 90s, we do have learned it's more civic, thanks to a lot of ecological changes, especially where I live, traffic calming, you know, special water runoffs, cleaner air that the social media can be the same and that we will have to go through this toxic phase and then make it a public utility instead of a private utility uh, owned by Google and Facebook. Um, and so all those things, are, we mustn't feel powerless. We mustn't feel despairing. We must be angry, but we mustn't ever think because here's just, I'll end on two data points. Two years ago, everybody was saying, it's over. And I was saying to them, oh, I don't know. Look at his rise in the polls. Nothing will stop him. Obviously, we think we made little dent with the crony contracts and all that. But who would have said two years ago? Well, a year ago, actually two years ago, that a year later, Dominic Cummings would be. Well, who would say you'd have somebody crossing the floor, that you'd have Davis, Dave, David Davis saying, for the, the sake of God, go. Never despair. Never despair. Brilliant. Just on that, just a follow up. Um, Chris Hammond asks, how can all the bylines, byline times and TV reach out beyond the bubble to influence small people? All of them are writing about things that matter, unlike the mainstream media. Um, I mean, obviously, one of, the things, one of the things that we face is that we have to use the evil Facebook <laughs> and social media to reach to reach other people. So what's what what what's your feeling on well, that? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know. Uh, the Binance Networks and yourself are great on uh, Facebook. We're actually learning some lessons from you on Facebook. And just because, you know, these privatised streets, the sort of awful means of transport, what's have the great stink of the Thames in London, the city, you still use the city, even though it was corrupt and needed reforming. You can still use social media as we do in Twitter, even though, but always diversify, always have direct mailing lists. And what we found is, you know, the Binance Times, is getting more traction, just breaking more stories. You know, we get a lot of support from the bylines networks and yourself. TV is really important because the biggest universe after Facebook is YouTube. Twitter's tiny. Twitter's like a few hundred million. It's like, you know, it's like four billion on Facebook and three billion on YouTube. And so you have to be crafty. You have to find where the points of traction are in social media. But there is a world outside there. You know, there's a world... As I said, in your allotment, in your church hall, your neighbours, mass protests, you know, just took down the pub, you know, spread the word. The great thing about the physical newspaper, people give it to the Daily Mail reading mother-in-law, whatever it is. Um, I think that the change will happen much quickly. And I'm glad Johnson's hanging on a bit, that they won't do this defenestration for the fourth time in my lifetime, midterm, and have to change everything that it's going to be so catastrophic so I'm going to push it to the end there will have to be reform and and in that way you've got to make you know when you talk about these things cab drivers London cab drivers oh my god they're revolutionaries now they want a citizens assembly you know? <laughs> your citizens assembly is in your black cab when you're and you talk about Johnson you know kleptocracy or or you know, one rule for them and one rule for us um profound yeah, and underneath there's a profound economic reform. All of this goes back to the crash of 2007, 8, I'm sure Richard would agree. And that's when kleptocracy became 
a better option than the free market. <laughs> Basically, get under the, your legs under mm-hmm. government, under the table of government, as Molly mm-hmm. says. And so that even building a business, even building a business which treats people fairly, employs young people, rewards their talents, doesn't rip them off, that's doing something. Can I jump in and sort of build on that? Because I think that's fantastic. And I like the other comments about, you know, down the allotment or wherever else. I used to have an allotment. I often do some research by actually just going to sit and, I mean, I don't do much of this at the moment because I'm sheltering for COVID right now. Um, but if you want to go and have a haircut, I, I actually use it for research. My barber's a really good source of information of what's happening around the town. Um, and I build sort of networks. Um, my teenage sons think I know everybody. I live in a town of 16,000 people. I don't know everybody, of course, but I seem to know a lot because I make it my business just to have a chat or get to know people and so on. And I learn and I impart a little bit. And there's a number of people who do that right here. You know, in Ely, where I live, I'm, I'm in East Anglia. I'm far away from where you are. I'm not in the West Country at all. I'm in the East. But we actually have a Progressive Alliance group in East Anglia and in Ely. And it meets together and it brings together people from different parties. And we talk about it. Now, is it going to change the political scene at the moment? I don't know, actually. Yeah, the last, before the last local election, the Tories here had 28 of the 30 seats. After the election, they had 16 of the 30 seats and the Lib Dems had 14. An awful lot of people voted Lib Dem. Somebody somewhere had put out the word, that's what you need to do to get rid of the Tories in the local area. It was a radical transformation. And I think it's because there were so many of these conversations going on. So don't dismiss those little conversations, those moves, them getting getting people to talk to each other, even if most in the party that you know, whether it's Labour, Lib Dem, Green, whoever, who are intransigent. I can't talk to anybody else. And I get that often. Just persist. Try to get them to come to a meeting, get them to talk to each other, find the common grounds, because there's much more that brings us together than divides us most of the time. And we're all human beings. And actually, we're all being oppressed. And and, frankly, that thing, the one percent, which pretty much emerged after 2008, is really important because this actually it's not one percent. It's less than one percent are repressing the rest. If you look at the wealth statistics and wealth is trickling up, power is trickling up and we have to reclaim that. We can only do it if we actually talk to understand and trust to each other to some degree. So it is vital to have these bottom up movements as well as big grand um, uh, endeavours, because frankly, they all work. They all contribute. And that's how it will change. And one of the things I think that gives us hope is there must be a massive raft of decent Tory voters in this. You know, in our region, we've got 34 MPs, 32 of them are currently Tory, you know, Conservative. And I can't believe, you know, that I can't believe that somebody who votes for Simon Hoare, you know, who's a fundamentally decent guy, can be at all happy about continuing to vote for a party that would blackmail people in order to support Johnson. You know, these people are homeless and they need scooping up and we need to reach out to them. I think it's incredibly important that we do that. So that's a very good message of hope. Now, we haven't had a huge number of questions and I don't want to um, make people sort of stay on longer than is um, longer than is absolutely necessary. um, Because we've got a big battle on our hands, but I think what the key messages are engage locally scoop people up, talk to people, listen to what people are saying, spread the word on, on the Byline, on Byline Times' articles, West Country Voices' articles, Byline's networks, share them, read them and share them, get them out to as many people as possible. And, you know, keeping talking and appearing out on those marches and demos. I mean, there's a very good turnout in Plymouth. There's a very good turnout in Exeter. I'm sure a lot of people will be going up on February the 5th. Um, and just keep keep hope alive and keep people motivated to actually do something. One of the things we most frequently get from people is there's no point writing to my MP because they don't respond or they send me a, 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 a photocopy, a cut and paste answer. There, we've got to keep writing. We've got to keep their mailbags tipped away. That, that point Naomi Smith made about the fact Nadine Doris was 
confidently boasting that she'd had no complaints at all, because probably a lot of constituents thought there is no point in writing to Nadine, not Doris. Um, but there is, and we must keep that pressure up. Absolutely um, crucial. Uh, right, but so before we go, any other questions? Let me just have a quick flick through. Brilliant. Well, I think it's it's a, a testimony to how concerned people are. Oh, Carol Cadwallader. Yes, um, Peter, obviously you're in the middle of that, but poor Carol is having a, an absolutely terrible time. What? Do, how do you feel it's going? Uh, something else tomorrow. Right. Um, she did an amazing job. I mean, uh, you know, I don't know if people understood what happened. She had a very good uh, truth back talk. I co-wrote with her the articles about Aaron Max and the Russian meetings because I, you know, got the emails. Uh, never one whether well, it was threatening me, Wigmore and Banks threatened to, the, said they reported me to the police for various reasons, but never did, of course. But I never got sued. So they're suing her as an individual for one line in a TED talk where she says, and as for Aaron Banks is multiple, uh, lies about his multiple contacts with the Russian uh, government, let's not go into that, right? Absolutely provably true. And what it is, is we don't know, he had these multiple meetings, he lied about them. Unfortunately, the judge in the meaning hearings, the first hearing, he had a libel, what is the meaning? Had a bigger meaning of it than Aaron Banks did. Aaron Banks would say, well, she's saying I took money. She didn't say, just lied about the meetings. The judge ruled he took the money. It means he took the money and undermined democracy. So she couldn't defend it on truth. She had to defend it on, therefore, public interest. Very strong defence. It may not be completely accurate, but the stakes are so high. It's huge public interest. and But that turns the burden of proof on the journalist. Suddenly, had it been a truth defence, it'd all be on Aaron Banks. Can't, you know, what did you do in those two days you disappeared off the internet and Andy Wigmore said you're in Russia sorting out this gold deal? You know, all this stuff. Instead, it turned on to her probity as a journalist. Did she do the right thing? Was she a good journalist? Is it public interest? And basically, you have one of the top QCs, like dozens of lawyers, million pound attack squad, uh, trying to nibble at the edges of her 40,000 word witness statement. I think she was very shaken. At first. There's so much to remember. She delivered 180,000 bits of data to them. Um, huge amount of and very personalized attack with no uh, protection from the observer the or the guardian uh or ted talk but i think she pulled it off in the end now the law is the law i think she wins in the court of public opinion and that's what matters and we must she's an amazing woman great friend but you're just amazing regardless as you can see and by defending her we're defending public interest journalism so that's what we're going to do whatever happens we won't get the ruling i don't think for quite a while Right. OK, thank you. And I think somebody up thread posted um, her crowdfunder for people who want to actively support her. But um, yes, she's uh, been key in the fight. <laughs> so I think given that we've got no further questions, I think I'll just just remains for me to thank our panelists and say Thank you so much for, for coming out, especially Molly, when you're feeling so grim, it's been really good of you to, 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 um, to stick it out. And for everybody else, go out and do something to defend our democracy. And um, everybody keep the fight up, keep cheerful. And we'll get there in the end. All right. Thank you all very much. Good night.